In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In The Last Days television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie is behind the scenes today, but she says hello. This is the program that looks at Israel. We look at the news and we have interviews and show you it's a, a wee bit of a window into Israel to see what's going on now. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Yitzhak Glick. Great to have you with us. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Th th thank you so much for coming into the studio uh, from Efrat. And uh, Dr. Yitzhak Glick has been in the news because you've been uh, particularly with your work with the Efrat uh, Clinic and uh, your work helping uh, the Palestinian villages. So we're going to talk all about that today, so you're not going to want to miss any of this program. Now, uh, you were originally born in the United States. That's and correct. you uh, came with your parents from the United States to, uh, to Israel. Uh, you served in the Israeli military in the IDF. And um, it was during that time, really, in, in Lebanon that you decided to for a medical career, so maybe that would be a good place to, to start off with. Yeah, um, I, made, I made Aliyah to Israel. We moved to Israel uh, from New York City in uh, the mid-70s when I was a teenager. Uh, I graduated high school in Israel, and then I had a dilemma whether to go to um, college, either in Israel or the U.S., or to join the Israeli army. Uh, I volunteered to join the Israeli army, and I was in the armored corps, the tanks, and I was the commander of a tank. Um, and served uh, regular service. And then in 1982, I was actually just starting my reserve duty when uh, Israel was being continuously attacked from the uh, uh, Lebanese border by uh, Palestinian uh, terrorists. And after repeat attacks, the Israeli army decided to uh, try to clean out the southern Lebanese area and the military uh, entered Lebanon and we had uh, several weeks of battles. And that for me was something that I did not expect to happen, but I guess I was ready for it. And uh, there I found myself in a battle uh, quite deep inside Lebanon. And uh, it was during this time that uh, you, you lost a lot of comrades, is, is that right? That's correct. In that battle, uh, our battalion, which uh, made up of about 20 to 30 tanks, and which would be about uh, 100 to 200 soldiers, uh, we lost about uh, somewhere between 10 to 20 uh, of our very close friends, people that I had served in the army with for many years, and I would really developed close relationships, and they were actually killed in front of my eyes. Uh, and uh, also there were three that were actually missing in action till today. So it was a, it was a pretty a tough battle. Uh, both the battle itself was, uh, was difficult, uh, fighting went on for several uh, consecutive days, and uh, loss of friends was, was very much of, a, of a, a turning point in my life. There's no question about that. Um, and I was just at the point of completing my army service and getting ready to make decisions as to what I was going to do in the future. Um, at that point, I'd actually been accepted to law school, and I was seriously considering starting law school. Uh, which was this was the summer of 1982, and uh, I was scheduled in the fall of 82 to start uh, law school uh, right after the, this battle and the loss of so many friends. I said, you know what, I want to dedicate myself to saving lives, and uh, I made a, 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 a decision during the course of that summer to take off a year, and I took off a year and I applied to medical school, and I ended up going to medical school in, in Jerusalem in Hebrew University. The, at the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical uh, School um, in in the uh, in Jerusalem. Now, the the reason that um, you've been featured in the news, uh, I guess, is because of your work with the Palestinian villages, which is so interesting. Maybe you could tell is is that because you you founded the Efrat Medical Center? Mm -hmm. So was the work with the Palestinian villages before? The Efrat Medical Center or after the center had been founded? That's a very good qu question. Um, th what, ha what occurred was, is simultaneously, um, the Intifada broke out, and I had just returned from some additional training in the United States. I actually came back from training um, 
in, in Cleveland. And the reason, this is very interesting itself, because the reason why I ended up going to Cleveland is because one of the leading emergency medical people in Israel, Dr. Applebaum, had been trained in Cleveland, and he uh, helped me get a position in Cleveland in a, in, a, in a training program. So because of Dr. Applebaum, I had gone to get trained in Cleveland. I get back to Israel in 1999, and right that time I was trying to figure out how to find myself in this area, living in a it's sort of a rural area, how I can um, help set up emergency medical services. And some of the things we wanted to help set up was uh, the ambulance service together with Magain David Adom, which is Israel's EMS service, and a emergency medical center. Both of these uh, services, the EMS service and the medical center, were something that didn't exist at that time. And at that time, exactly that summer, the Intifada broke out. And while I was just getting familiar with Maybe the... Maybe I'll just explain the Intifada, Intifada for our <coughs> Go ahead. viewers. I mean, a lot of you will know about this. So um, uh, for those who don't, the Intifada was a, uh, a, not a war, but it was similar to a war situation where you, the terrorists were attacking Israel and there was, uh, I guess, there were bus, bus bombings from memory and, and a lot of terrorist activity. So, sorry, I was j just so sure. that they know. <coughs> right, so the Intifada which, uh, broke out in, in the summer of, uh, summer of, 19, uh, of 1920, the summer of 2000, uh, Arafat and, uh, and Prime Minister Barack were negotiating in Camp David together with, uh, with uh, Bill Clinton and the negotiations fell apart. Uh, Arafat slammed the door and the next day uh, Israel was uh, faced with this horrific intifada, which is an uprising, but it was an armed uprising, and it was very unusual because Israel had permitted the Palestinian Authority to have weapons so that they could keep a law and order, and here they went and they were shooting people and, and blowing up buses, and this was ac actually the worst thing that happened to Israel since its establishment, because here it wasn't a, uh, a, a battle between soldiers, but this was a battle on the streets. It was cafes, it was pizzas, it was uh, discos, it was every single bus and, and, and it was on the roads. People were getting shot everywhere without any uh, uh, disc uh, discrimination between uh, Jews, adults, kids, women, children, everyone was being shot up and it was people blowing themselves up and there was no sense to it at all. And we were, so Israel was suddenly faced and our towns were under siege because the roads became so dangerous. We never envisioned that our roads would become so dangerous. So this scenario occurred where there's, a, there's suddenly a, a, a war going on within civilian communities. And at the same time, I had just come back from training in uh, emergency medicine. So I was faced with this situation. The mayor of the town came to me and said, we got to set something up. And, and that's when I, I went to Magain David Adom, which is a, a, the EMS system of Israel. I, I made contact with, again with Dr. Applebaum, which, who was my mentor and my teacher, and, and tried to figure out how to put together a medical center. And that's where, that's where it, really, it really began. And I could tell you a little bit about the medical center, or we could talk about, straight, uh, talk about a little bit about the interaction with Palestinians, but it happened simultaneously. So we set up a medical center, first and foremost, for uh, the, the, the area I live in is called Gush Etzion, which is adjacent to Bethlehem. It's a fabulous, beautiful area. It's the Judean hills just south of Jerusalem. And what's unique about it is there are, are 20 Jewish towns there and about uh, 20 uh, Palestinian towns. And um, over the years, the Palestinians and the Israelis have always, in this area, have always got together r reasonably well. It's, and it was, it's just, and what's nice about it, it's, it's the Judean hills adjacent to Bethlehem. It's that terrain where all of us have seen the Jerusalem hilly terrain. And it's a rural area. And, it's, uh, and it happens to be a, a, a beautiful area for peace to break out. And, and instead of battle broke out. And here we were faced with this horrific war. And um, the Israelis, who we set up the medical center for, needed a, a medical center. So we set up this medical center. And at the same time, the rabbi of our town and the leaders of our town were constantly reaching out to the Palestinian neighbors to try to some, find if, if on the national level they couldn't sign a peace treaty, on the, on the, at the grassroots level, let's try to live together and coexist to the best of our ability. Now, this was a real challenge. Now, Go for ahead. the viewers, the, the, a lot of them will not understand this. They'll think the Palestinians are very much uh, separate. In other words, there's no interaction whatsoever between Israelis and Palestinians. So, uh, that's that's a, 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 a very good point you're making because that's a total misconception. Israelis and Palestinians in Judea and Samaria uh, live together and mingle together in every single possible way. We, from the grocery store 
from the uh, our cafe, from our our gasoline station, and from our whether it's our hardware stores, we are living together essentially. And and the overwhel and the majority of people on both sides get along with each other and aren't looking for for uh, for to uh, incite against one another or to hate each other. And on the contrary, we realize that there's a lot to benefit from working together. We'd rather live together. We're, we don't feel that we want them to leave, and, and we don't intend to leave either. We're, we feel like you know there are 700,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria across the Green Line, so-called, and we absolutely feel that we're going to be there for good, and we want to live together uh, in peace with our Palestinian neighbors. And the, uh, the, um, I would say the majority of Palestinians understand this and realize that we should live together well. We, uh, we can each benefit from each other. So on all levels, and like I said, it's in, it could be in commerce, but in, in, in my field, the field of medicine, it's an, a, a, an unusual opportunity to uh, interact in a very compassionate, uh, caring way where everyone can benefit from that interaction. Now, some of the viewers will be saying, well, uh, it's, we, we understand that you're working with the Palestinians, and, and, um, but we hear the stories that it's very dangerous to enter a Palestinian village, or um, or even indeed the Israeli government have put up these signs, you know that, you know that you can't enter certain areas. So how 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 do how do you get around that? Okay, so that's a very good point as well. Um, people who don't live there um, don't realize that there are three different areas. There's the area A, area B, and area C. So area A, and it's very easy to make an association for your listeners. A is the Arab areas, and those areas are totally controlled. Uh, by the uh, Palestinian Authority, that's A is for Arabs, B will be in between, B between, and C is Israelis, uh, the Israeli area. So uh, um, the, the areas that I'm talking about is the B area. I do not enter, it's against is, uh, Israeli law for Israelis to enter the A, the A area, into the Arab area. The reason why we're not allowed to enter there is because we would be, we, our lives would be in danger. And, and that's crystal clear when uh, uh, Israelis have accidentally ended up in there and, and th there's been a uh, uh, serious uh, result. Um, the, the B area is more of the rural area. And some of those areas are very are within the, the Etzion block, the Gush Etzion block in our area, and those are the towns I go into. Now, um, most of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time, I, I go in accompanied by a uh, by uh, by the call of a Palestinian um, town uh, leader or the town mayor, so I'll get a call from them and they will accompany me. So and 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 it happens to be that the uh, the Arabs and Palestinians are, are ha have potential to be wonderful neighbors, and and when they invite you into their house, for the most part, you're 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 you know you're safe there. And that's uh, the wonderful thing about the uh, Arab culture and Palestinian culture. They 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 are uh, leaders in their culture. Of inviting the the uh, outsiders into their home, and they're very uh, very strict about not hurting someone that they invite from the outside. And I I I that's how that's that's the way it works. And uh, so and but I do agree with you, your point that there always is a risk because you never know mm -hmm. if there's some kind of extremist there that wants to you know to, to cause uh, you know hate and stuff like that, and and he would want to harm both the the Palestinians that are interested in peace and the Israelis. So when you go into the uh, into the to, to the village, uh, are you able to? You, you, you're kind of like a, what we would call in the United Kingdom a GP, where right. you go exactly. in as a, a doctor right. to treat, I guess, m minor minor ailments. Well, what well, I, I treat is everything. First of all, uh, and you, you're 100 percent right. It's, uh, I go in there mostly. A lot of the cases I'm treating are people that ha that are immobile. And these are elderly people that can't get out and go out and see the doctors. So it's often, very often, I, I end up seeing the elderly and the uh, immobile and the, uh, uh, the disabled. So the, the answer is I, I actually get called for anything. And a lot of the, f the, uh, the interactions there could even be just phone uh, uh, conversations of what should we do in this and that scenario, or actually I'll, I'll make rounds there. Uh, you know, a couple times a week, and uh, see specific patients that are that have specific problems. But uh, you know, it's 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 sort of uh, dependent on what what happens at that moment. And when I least expect it, there's a patient waiting for me. Or anything. And do you get involved with uh, such things as delivering babies? Or no. <laughs> well, I mean, whatever anything that needs an immediate ambulance, what we do is we call the Magen David 
uh, EMS system, and the Magin David, uh, uh, which is the EM Israeli EMS system, has now developed a very good relationship with the Palestinian Red Crescent, and there immediately they both have very good response times. And this is something that wasn't, uh, the situation wasn't this way uh, uh, 15 years ago, but as things developed, and as Israel assisted the Palestinian Authority to move ahead, thanks to Israel, the Palestinian Authority has made giant strides ahead in providing health care. And one of, the, uh, one of the things that we, that we, we um, encounter is the, the Palestinian EMS system has improved tremendously, both equipment-wise, training-wise, and interactions are fabulous. We have good, positive interactions with the, with the crews, and, and that's the way it should be. So the, uh, would they be referred to an Israeli hospital or? Very uh, good question again. So uh, in every scenario, if we, we, we assess the scenario, if it's an overwhelming emergency that can't wait at all, we won't even wait a minute and we'll take them to an Israeli hospital. But nowadays we are, oh, because they have such a good response time and they're there on the scene, I immediately will ask the Palestinian EMS person, is this something, this is a car accident, is this something that should be taken to, to Hebron or Bethlehem? And they will immediately say this could be handled in our hospitals. And, and now we know that their hospitals are, are, are up to par. And are, they may not be as good as Israeli hospitals. Like, for example, they, they may not have a, a neurosurgery service as good as there is in, in, in Jerusalem. And if it looks like it could be a, a head injury, we're more likely, again, to take it into a Jerusalem hospital. But we, uh, our teams are very well trained. In, in, and if they don't, they, could even, they can always radio back and say, okay, I have this in the scenario. Should this be going to a Palestinian hospital? Should this be going to an Israeli hospital? And, and, and the, the cooperation between the, the teams is, is phenomenal, is excellent. And that's a, 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 a real change. But even during the Intifada, we did have some relationship. And this, if there was one field where there was re good or reasonable relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it was in the field of, of emergency medicine. So uh, that's, that, that was an opportunity to maintain uh, an ongoing relationship with, uh, with, uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, one of the things you do uh, is you're uh, voluntary as uh, the medical director at um, Efrat, uh, but you go to Cleveland once a month right. to, uh, unbelievably, you go all that way to America to serve in, a, in, a, as a, in an emergency hospital, I right. guess, uh, well, the uh, ER department, I right. guess. And you do that once a month? Right. So I, I, uh, I'm an American by nature, and I grew up in the United States, and I love the United States very much. And uh, part of my emergency medical training was in the U.S., and uh, I had a very good position. And when it was time to head back to uh, Israel with my family, we were, uh, you know, I had mixed feelings. On the one hand, I very much am dedicated and patriotic towards Israel, and my wife and family wanted to all go back to Israel. At the same time, I had a very good job in the U.S., and our temporary compromise was that I would work part-time there and part-time in Israel, and that it started as a one-year trial, uh, and then I said I'll do another two years, and it was three years and four years, and now it's 17 years that I've been doing this, uh, going back and forth. It's, uh, it's something I don't recommend to others, but it happens to be in my personal scenario. A lot having to do with the fact that by working uh, a little about uh, 12 to you know two weeks in the U.S. It enables me to have two weeks free to do all this volunteer work, and and I find that that's very re rewarding, and enables me to have some freelance uh, of time to do uh, what I what I, I I love doing most, which is uh, volunteering and do uh, and trying to help people organize uh, uh, emergency medical uh, systems, etc. So you you were working a lot with the in the intifada, as you were saying, with the terrorists attacks and uh, which is must be a very difficult scenario to go into and um, you, you did have the military service but right. most most people would see things that you shouldn't ever need to see and uh, I, I'm particularly the, the, the story I wanted to share with the viewers before we get to the end of the program was the one about Kathy Hillel which was so traumatic for you personally because uh, the person that had really encouraged you I guess from from the research was Dr. David Apple, Applebaum, mm -hmm. and then Kathy Hillel, which is a, a terrorist attack. I think we've covered, we, we covered on in the last day's television program. 
the terrible attack of the cafe next right. to the prime minister's office. Right, moment. Right. I was so were you were you called out to that? So uh, actually, this was about 11:20 at night and in the evening, and I had just come from the medical center in Efrat, and I was heading home, and I literally the beeper went off, and they said there was a mass casualty event with numerous injured people, and I was just at my car. And I started driving towards Jerusalem, and I was having, uh, I was contacting the EMS uh, command center, trying to figure out whether I should go to the scene or whether I should go to the the, the uh, one of the local emergency rooms to be, uh, you know, to add a helping hand. And uh, as I entered Jerusalem, which is about a, a seven-minute drive from where I, which I was driving relatively fast, it's usually more of a 50-minute drive, but it was. And as I entered Jerusalem, I asked the command center, the EMS command center, should I go to the scene? And they said, go ahead to the scene. And when I got to the scene, there were still some uh, injured there, and I was treating injured. And then I started getting these phone calls from doctors uh, who work in Dr. Applebaum's medical emergency room, which is actually one of the leading emergency rooms in Israel, asking me, is Dr. Applebaum on the scene? Now, he, he was, Dr. Applebaum was the director, wasn't he? Is that right? Right. He was the director of the, uh, one of the leading uh, hospital emergency rooms um, in Jerusalem. And he was actually the leader of, of emergency medicine in the Jerusalem area. He was everyone's teacher. He was, he was a very unusual personality, very learned person. He was a rabbi himself. And at the same time, he was a, uh, a brilliant emergency physician and a, a brilliant uh, leader in organizational skills and a, and a teacher. And here, they're suddenly asking me, is he on the scene? And I, I understood it to mean, is he treating patients? And he's, his presence is very visible when he's on the scene. When he's on the scene, everything is evolving around him. And I said, no, he's not on the scene because, you know, I would have seen him. And then I got a second and a third call, is Dr. Applebaum on the scene? This is already 15 minutes into the event. And I said, he's not on the scene. He's clearly not on the scene. And then they said to me, uh, he may have been hurt or injured. Can you take a better look? And then I saw, I saw the body. And this was the night before his daughter's wedding, and he had gone for a, uh, a father-daughter uh, talk the night before her wedding, and they were going to sit in a uh, cafe and have a, uh, a serious conversation, and, and they were both lying once, one next to, their, uh, to each other. And she was a uh, 20, 21, 20, 20 or 21-year-old girl. Um, and she was actually had done volunteer work herself with uh, with cancer patients, and there they were lying in front of me, and and she was in perfect condition. Her body was unscathed. Uh, he had a a, 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 sh a shrapnel injury to his uh, his forehead, but um, and that was the shock of my life, and it was really and it was a shock for for everyone in, in Jerusalem because everybody knew him. And as I was there, actually the mayor of Jerusalem walked up and. We all saw what we saw, and it was a, it was a devastating moment. Uh, and there's no question that was a uh, a critical moment in my life. And again, uh, thinking and seeing things in a very different. And actually, that event was one of the last um, mass casualty um, suicide bombs events in Jerusalem. After that, things uh, things got be got a lot better. But that was uh, un unfortunately, and it. Um, Dr. Applebaum's children have all gone into the emergency medical field. He has four. He had he had he had six children. His daughter was killed. He has five left. Four. I know for a fact four out of the five are in the uh, in emergency medical field. Some more in the administrative level, and some in the paramedics. And he has a son who's also an emergency physician, and they're all following in his uh, footsteps. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that was really a challenge. Uh, but throughout the Intifada, during those those years from 2000, 2003, 2004, we as Israelis encountered uh, daily and weekly attacks where neighbors of ours were killed just by suicide bomb bombers who had all they were interested in was death and murder and killing, and they certainly were not interested in peace. And it was a it was a horrific situation. Now, since since that uh, terrible time of the inter uh, th there was the first intifada and the second intifada, but since those uh, uh, terrible times, the the which is quite interesting because the BBC and the media portray the war or the the separation fence as a bad thing, but you've seen the the number of of attacks dramatically. Decrease is that is that right? Absolutely. There's no question that uh, they, uh, Israel had no choice but to put up a security fence because uh, Palestinian terrorists were just attacking Israel in, in every possible place and time, 
and they put up the fence and it, and it put a sudden end to it. Now, a lot of people on both sides of the political camp are opposed, to, many people are opposed to the fence. There are the people that say, oh, we can't uh, uh, separate, uh, stop the movement of Palestinians. And there are those that say we can't stop the movement of Israelis because it, it, there, there's, there's two viewpoints. And obviously it's not an ideal. I mean, who wants to have a fence in the middle of their country? But there, we didn't have a choice at that point. And obviously Israel was in a very unusual situation. It was, it was a very sad situation because the whole world were looking at it as if, uh, as if Israel was taking too much of a, 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 a stiff position, which was totally wrong. I mean, Israel uh, was up against the wall. Uh, thousands, over a thousand Israelis were killed, and Israel really was, had no choice. And uh, the message ha has to be that uh, Israel wants peace, but peace requires both sides compromising. And there's going to have to be, the Palestinians think that, you know, Israel is going to just hand them the entire West Bank. It's obvious that Israel is not going to be able to hand them the, the entire West Bank, uh, which we call Judea and Samaria. Israel is not going to be handing over Judea and Samaria uh, to the Palestinians. There are Palestinian areas, and uh, there's, that's always been on the negotiating table. The areas that, uh, of A and B, like I said before, that could be a future Palestinian state. But the, clearly the areas where are, that are um, predominantly Jewish, where the 700,000 Jews live, um, are, is, is going to stay with Israel. And sooner or later, it's just a matter of time, whether it will be 10 years from now or 20, Israel, Israel is going to annex those because Israel is, is clearly not going to move 700,000 Israelis and no one thinks they should. And it's obviously, uh, I mean, that's what the, the future has in, in, in store. And for that reason, and for that reason, the, the most important thing is we have to get along with each other. And the people that are living there, whether they're Israelis, whether they're Muslims, whether they're Christians, whether they're Druze, we've got to get along. We've run out of time. It's been okay. so interesting. Thank you so much for coming across from Ifrat. And uh, we very much appreciate, you know, uh, your spending time. And I know the viewers, you will have enjoyed that so much, uh, the program. Uh, don't forget that you can visit the website www.inthelastdays.com and email us. We love to receive your emails at info at inthelastdays.com. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station, for the next program from In the Last Days.